Hi, this is my hand drawing on a white page, a series of gestures leaving traces, sometimes reinforcing and sometimes competing with what I am saying. My name is Johnny Gray, and I am an associate professor in speech communication at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. Jesus, a viewer of this YouTube channel, recently asked about the relationship between performance and pedagogy. Now, Benny Lemaster has already taken a whack at responding to that question. It's a good response. You should check it out. Benny also invited me to respond. Hey, why not? I like teaching. I like performance. I even sometimes consult with new graduate students about teaching. My teaching is heavily influenced by performance studies and performative pedagogy. But what does that mean exactly? Does it mean how teachers are always performing and classrooms are sort of like stages? Does it mean pretending to be something you aren't? Is it getting your students to perform? From my perspective, it's all of these things. Performance is a creative act and itself an interesting tool of inquiry. But let's start with a caveat about Jesus's question. Jesus asks, what ways might you enact performance as a means to teach which you are not fully equipped to teach? Now, implicit in this question is the idea that performance might stand in for knowledge, at best fill in gaps in your preparation, at worst razzle-dazzle students so that they won't notice you don't know what you're talking about. Truthfully, yes, you can use performance to pretend to be what you aren't, to hide your lack of preparation or qualification, to pretend to be an expert. But this is not all that performance is, despite a rather hit lengthy history of it being treated as only this, that is, fakery and trickery. And truthfully, we need to get away from the idea that expertise is something you have or don't have. Expertise is relational. It develops and devolves over time. It is never absolute. If you have been asked to teach a class, somewhere, someone has determined that you are qualified to do so. Feeling nervous about teaching, not unlike feeling jitters before walking out on stage, is a good thing, especially if it challenges you to do better, to be a better teacher. Now, embedded in the concern about teaching are remnants of a predominant perspective that teaching is nothing more than the transferal of knowledge from teacher to student. The teacher has all the yummy good knowledge and dispenses it like nutrients to hungry, hungry students. The much-revered Brazilian critical pedagogue, Paulo Freire, called this perspective on teaching the banking model. He had many reasons to be suspicious of it. The banking model derives its name from an economic model. Knowledge is a thing that is transferred, and education is merely knowledge purchased. But who can afford it? And to what extent does this approach feature learning as acquisition of facts over engagement and processes? Are students ever allowed to explore why a particular piece of knowledge is valued over others? Are they allowed to test this knowledge against its applicability in their own lived experience? But is all learning best suited to such an approach? Performative pedagogy, along with other approaches like critical pedagogy, problem-based learning, place-based education, and experiential learning, assert, no, it is not. The banking model participates in a Cartesian split, privileging the mind over the body, and fails to recognize the benefits of learning with the entire body, engaging in processes of exploration, and doing so with other people. So consider one of the oldest forms of performance and teaching, uh, storytelling. Whether you do it on a stage or get everyone in a circle, at a certain level, teaching is telling a story. From Socrates to Jesus, probably before and certainly after, great wisdom has been imparted by telling stories. A story isn't just facts. It's making a case for how they go together. And in most storytelling traditions, the listeners are not simply quiet, but play the role of interlocutor. They ask questions. They help tease out the moral of the story. And they negotiate the different versions of the story they have already heard. I'm amused sometimes when new teachers think that sitting in a circle by itself somehow takes away the presumed problematic of desks in rows facing one direction. King Arthur tried to challenge hierarchy by having a round table for his knights, but no one at that table had any doubts about who wore the crown. How you configure the space affects the story, but the configuration of the space doesn't do all the work alone. So that's some of the ways to see what the teacher does as performance. Where we do begin to see a breakdown in that hierarchy, a little, perhaps, is creating space for the students to also perform, to tell their stories, getting them up on their feet, so to speak, but that's kind of ableist language. Not every student, after all, is able to get up on their feet. But they are able to perform, and in most of our classes and communication studies, we like to give a fair amount of time over to the students taking the stage, presenting to their peers. Many of them may never be teachers, let alone professional performers, so what's the point? Well, communicating one to many is pretty fundamental to the human experience. Plus, like exercise, it is about enhancing our ability. 
Nobody just gets up one day and runs or rolls a race, not successfully anyway, without some preparation. And plenty of us do the exercise without any intention to race. But we know our minds and bodies and mind-body's abilities to do what it does is enhanced by giving it lots of opportunity to do so, even if we feel silly and self-conscious when we are. But of course we do exercise for a reason, to get better at something. From my perspective, and I'm not alone in this, performance isn't just an end result, the product of a presentation on some sort of stage. Performance is itself a mode of inquiry, for exploration. It provides tools for exploring issues and phenomena. In traditional theater, rehearsal isn't just about learning blocking and lines. Actors carefully investigate the text through performance to discern what motivates the characters. They test different performance choices with others and decide and discover which are the most rewarding. Imagine turning a similar skill not just to a dramatic play but to a poem or a short story. Who is this narrator? Where and why is she saying this? Now take it a step further. Broaden the text beyond the literary. What would it mean to use performance to explore social relations, media ethics, politics, nature, and so on? Investigating these phenomena with performance tools, and doing so with some goal of being able to share what you discover with others via some means of performative presentation. But here's the important part. In this metaphor, as teacher, you too are exploring. You too are willing to learn from what your students discover. This is a very different model from banking or having to be some absolute expert who possesses all the knowledge. Okay, so keeping with this metaphor of the explorer, let's think about gear. Every form of exploration requires particular gear. If you're going to climb an alpine mountain, you're going to need an ice axe. If you need to cross a wide river, you're going to need a raft. So what tools do performers need? Well, there are many, but grant that this is a metaphor, a visual metaphor even. In any given exploration, performers need to first consider safety, theirs and anyone they want to take with them. Performance is not a license to act unsafely or put others at risk. Most explorers study their territory and what previous explorations have learned. So too, performers benefit from knowing a bit what has come before them. Usually, the teacher provides something of a prompt, which might be seen as a way of narrowing the focus of their exploration. And of course, performers need to have some sense of what presentational resources are available to them, what kind of stage, how long do they have to explore and to present, and presentational technologies, and so forth. If the teacher is taking the role of the guide in this metaphor, one of the most important things a guide does is a gear check before the exploration begins. What readings will you provide? What guiding questions? What rules about safety on the trail? What prohibitions? And so forth. So even though we are resisting the idea of an absolute expert, the teacher guide does have some responsibilities. You want to be careful about what territories you send your students off to explore and how well you prepare them to do so. Now let's pause here for a brief note on prompts. How you set up the assignment or series of assignments will have a big impact on how the exploration goes. Pose provocative and interesting questions, questions that cannot be easily answered, questions for which there are more than one right answer. I also like to have students explore paradoxes. A paradox is two seemingly contradictory propositions that are both true at the same time. Craig Gingrich Philbrook via Kristen Langelier and Eric Peterson sometimes call these creative double binds. Consider why the highly mediated way I have chosen to communicate here, these jerky sketches on a YouTube video, is and is not an effective way to talk about bodily performative learning. The tension between the is and the is not may be the most provocative aspect of this performance, getting us all thinking and hopefully generating some response. I can think of no more immediately accessible source of double binds and paradoxes than the multiple roles we negotiate daily. Many graduate students experience the tension of shifting roles, one hour teaching a class and then the next turning around and being the student in a seminar. Because their roles are so fluid in this regard, they are often denigrated by their students as not really teachers. Remember that banking model? A student, or parent, or politician, or... may complain about the investment they've made in a college education only to have classes taught by another student. Grumble, grumble, grumble. Here, the perception is that our roles are fixed. The graduate student is only a student, and therefore not a teacher. Not a real teacher, anyway. But a quick inventory of all of our lives shows that we are constantly shifting roles. A college roommate may or may not also be a best friend. Sometimes that friend may also be a classmate. Negotiating the role of friend with the expectation of fellow classmate working on a collaborative project may cause all kinds of relational tension. After all, it's not like we are ever just one role and not the other. Now, 
Imagine using performance as a tool to explore those roles and our expectation around role behavior. Can your boss be your friend? Who do you owe more loyalty to, your teammate or your parent? How does this change depending upon context? Wait, see what I did there? The same kind of role negotiations you may have experienced as teacher-students is not that different from the kinds of role negotiations others are experiencing. Haven't we just opened up problematics about essentializing roles and assuming our expectations for such? Isn't this kind of role negotiation a shared experience, and one provocatively and productively explored through performance? And now, suddenly, questions about roles lead to questions about relationship and context and of necessity. That leads to questions about power and who has it and who doesn't. Only power isn't ever only one thing, and it comes in many different forms, and sometimes you have more of it and sometimes you have less of it. And power circulates differently in different systems, and systems define and are defined by roles within the system. And performance is both a tool for reinforcing power structures and a tool for imagining and instantiating alternatives. And suddenly, that territory we are exploring is fraught with danger and possibility. Admittedly, it would be easier if education were simply a bank, and all you had to worry about is the transfer of knowledge, the commerce of facts. But think what gets left out in that model. Performance, despite our best efforts to make it so, is never without risk. It frequently strays into the messy. If you are exploring with your students, there's never any guarantee about what you will discover. Is this all there is to say about performance and pedagogy? Far from it. This is a brief sketch that barely scratches the surface. This is many messages competing with each other for your attention. This is one arm connected to a much bigger body. This is me, exploring alternative ways of communicating a life's interest, trying my hand at drawing in public and participating in a vlog channel. I am no expert at either, but I hope you've gotten something out of the exploration.